JJ, you're watching Reality Survival, and today we have with us the founder and CEO of Jace Medical, uh, Dr. Sean Rowland. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, you bet, man. So I've uh, been an affiliate with your company for, I don't know, maybe 18 months or something like that now. It's been been quite a while. I think it's a pretty awesome service um, that really has been needed for the prepping community for, for a while. You know, can you maybe just tell us a little bit about what it is and what you guys do? And Absolutely. So at Jace Medical, our, our mission statement really is, is we are on a mission to empower everyone to be better prepared medically. And, you know, there's a couple, maybe two important points there. One is everyone. And two is, is medical preparedness. Um, we started this mission. We kind of just took it in its first little chunk and grew out from there. We started by servicing just adults and really just providing access to uh, critical emergency type medications. Um, and we chose to start with antibiotics. And from there, we've grown to include uh, not just adults, but children and not just antibiotics, but other emergency medications, antivirals, antifungals. Um, and then we've actually also included the chronic medications that people depend on on a daily basis, whether that's for diabetes, seizure disorders, high blood pressure, um, and providing them access to a year's supply. Uh, again, all with the goal of, of being better prepared medically. And we've got uh, a lot more still to come on the horizon with the medical preparedness. Very cool. So was this uh, triggered by like COVID or, you know, changes in law that happened during that time frame, or what was sort of the genesis of all of it? How did it get started? Yeah. You know, you, in the preparedness community, uh, as you've said, this is something that's been needed for some time. Yeah. And so why did it take till now for it to be a thing? Um, and I think there's a few things that play into that. Uh, certainly uh, timing is a big one and, and what's going on in society for us. Uh, COVID did play a role. Um, although I will say the, the main impetus behind, uh, behind Jace came about prior to COVID, but it was due to experiencing firsthand uh, as a myself, as a family medicine physician and working um, on an inpatient service at our at a local uh, our community hospital. I was in New Mexico at the time, uh, and we were experiencing shortages. This was a few years before COVID, and so that was kind of the very first wake up call to looking in deeper. What's going on? Why is this happening? Uh, got things obviously got a lot worse and a lot more uncertainty during COVID. But one of the things that maybe we could call it a silver lining is uh, telemedicine really kind of took a leap forward during COVID, not just from a regulatory standpoint, but just from an adoption standpoint for the general public. People yeah. were now used to accessing their healthcare needs through this, through these telemedicine platforms. Um, so that was a big thing. And then, and then yes, the States did um, roll back and make it a lot easier. Now I will say post COVID they've, they've reinstituted a lot of those, those uh, I'd say some of them are a little, a little heavy handed from the regulatory side. But we were able to, you know, get your foot in the door, get the public to to adopt it, and so combining the first, just the the, the knowledge that hey, we are on a razor's edge when it comes to uh, where we sit in the supply chain uh, for our pharmaceuticals and and uh, access to healthcare in general, uh, number one, and then number two, how can we deliver this service? How can we use these force multipliers, which is what telemedicine is at the end of the day? Um, combining the two, uh, and you get you get this service that was previously not available. Talk. Can you talk a little bit about the supply chain issues a little bit more? You said you kind of dug into that. What where are our vulnerabilities with that? I mean, what is yeah. the? I've heard a lot of people talk about. You know, we we rely too much on foreign countries, and can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So unfortunately. Here in the United States, and this is something that uh, you know obviously wasn't common knowledge. It wasn't that some, nothing that I knew about. I dug into it, spent about two years just really digging in and finding out as much as I could. Um, and now, since we've started Jace, you know, I, I routinely run into people. It's just it's just not common knowledge. And I'm, I'm we're, that's why I'm here now. It's why I'm on this on your show is is just every day trying to get the word out uh, about this because I think it's a huge issue. It's a national security issue. I mean, there's a lot of implications here. And what, what I'm talking about is that really here in the United States, uh, 
by by most accounts, about 95% of what we consume here in the United States are, are what we classify as generic medications. These are medications that have been out for a long time. They're not your kind of sexy brand name that you see the commercials for on TV. You know, they cost a thousand to three thousand dollars a month. These are your everyday meds, the antibiotics you take, those chronic medications I mentioned. Those are generic medications. Uh, they're they're about ninety five percent of what we consume. Of the of those generic medications, virtually one hundred percent of them are produced outside the United States. And wow. and if you look at the at there, you can pull up the list of the top five um, manufacturers in the world for generic medications. Um, in one form or another, uh, China plays a role in, in all of them. So the active pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, most of them are coming out of China. Even just some of the other ingredients, what we we'll call them the fillers, um, are also coming out of China. So it's China, it's India, there's some other countries scattered in there. That in and of itself obviously presents some problems, just uh, sure. you know, whether they're political tensions, whether it's just the distance that's involved. And there's a lot of consolidation that's happened where you might have uh, one or two factories that are providing the world's supply of a particular medication. Um, and so all of these play into that supply chain issue. And it's not just us. This is another complicating factor. This is for the world. So any other country, whether it's Canada, whether it's Europe, whether it's Japan, um, are, are in the same line as we are when it comes to um, needing to access these medications from places like China. And so... Uh, really without going too far down the rabbit hole, I think that's a good just general understanding that all these medications are, are produced outside the US. Uh, the other complicating factor to this is we have groups like the FDA who we've, you know, we entrust the, uh, the FDA to, to uh, manage and, and to tell us that these, are, these medications are approved, that they're safe and, and to help us uh, understand where they're coming from. And unfortunately, even the FDA, if you if you uh, when you dig into it, um, there's some shocking uh, to me. There's shocking revelations that even the FDA, in a lot of instances, uh, does not know where the raw ingredients are coming from. Uh, when when you look at a factory, let's say some factory in China making a medication that the they might know the basics of what's coming out of that factory, but they don't know what's coming into the factory to get. To, to, wow. to make those medications. They don't know the production capacity of the factory. So when we have these shortages, we just hit the high watermark um, since, since this has been tracked for the little over 20 years, um, medication shortages. And we just hit a new high watermark last week with 323 medications on the shortage list. Um, that list just continues to get bigger. And, and people ask, well, what can we do about it? Or and the fact is, when you trace it back, we don't know what the capacity of a, is of a factory. We a lot of the times when it does shut down, there's a quality issue. Um, we don't know specifically what that is, and we certainly don't know where ultimately they're getting their ingredients from. So a lot to talk, a, a lot you can talk about there. But at the end of the day, here we are. What are we? What can we do? And I would love to bring production back to the United States. I think apart from what I talked about, there's national security implications here. Um, there's a lot of things that I'd love to do. Uh, but you know, these things take time, they're complex, they're expensive. Sure. Uh, and so what can we do today? Well, what I can do today is, is I can provide access as a, as a physician to my patients. And, and that is what Jace Medical is. It's a solution for that people can access today to alleviate some of these issues. Very good. So just, I just want to recover just a little bit of what you just said there. So if I understood you correctly, you said there's currently 323 medications that are on a like a supply chain shortage list right now? Correct. Um, wow. There's, I didn't there's, realize there was that many. I knew there was a lot, but I didn't know it was that many. That's yeah, crazy. There's two, the FDA maintains a list and I, no surprise here, but the better list is maintained by a different group. It's the Hospital Pharmacists of America. Um, they go into more detail and, and, and have, a, a, at the end of the day though, their, their list is, I, I would just say it's, it's, it's a better list. And yes, they reached this new, this, this new high of 323. Um, you're right. You don't hear a lot about it. You'd think you'd hear more about it than the news. Some, a lot of these medications maybe are, are just medications you'd access if you were in the hospital, you know, IV type injectable medications, um, but others are not. Others are like two winters ago when if you were a, a, if you were a, a parent trying to get amoxicillin for your child, uh, it was impossible. And, mm. and so even those common everyday medications come up 
And the one thing I, I do caution people is, you know, you, you, you want to look to see is my med on that list. That's the first thing you want to do. And if it's not on the list, woof, sigh of relief. Right. I'd say, hold on, because right. this list is changing every day. There's no reason why, why whatever medication you're taking might not be on the list <clears throat> tomorrow or next week. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you, you got to take that with a grain of salt that you're not just because your, your medication isn't on the list today doesn't mean it won't be tomorrow. Absolutely. I think, you know, also from a perspective of national security, as tensions rise with China, you know, and and even even with India, you know, they're part of the BRICS system and all that kind of thing. And those, you know, as those relationships start to shift or change, you know, I mean, hopefully in a positive direction, but it could be in a negative direction, then th there could be more and more and it might be intentional. Like, you know, it could be. Talk about an ace up their sleeve. I just. The, the, this was done very purposefully over over decades uh, by the Chinese government to subsidize the the, the pharmaceutical market to encourage this mm. you know this migration um, from production uh, here in the United States to to China, and at this point they've I mean they've they kind of got us where they where they want us if it, if they wanted to cut off supply for we're talking vital medications that people uh, need every day to survive. Um, right. you know, they, they've, they've got control over that, over that supply or to think that, that our soldiers, including ourselves, if we were ever, uh, on under any kind of a bioterror attack, uh, we're dependent on a couple of particular medications, uh, that we don't even make, um, and, hmm. and would likely be made by the country that was, <laughs> that was doing the bioterror attack. You know. So it's just crazy to, when you, when you, and it's something that, Congress, they talk about it every year, and here and there they make a, a, a policy and 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 do some, you know, try to do something, but but nothing meaningful that's making any real difference has yet to be done, and and even when it is, you know, to stand up a a an antibiotic factory, for example, the fermentation process and, and all that goes into the manufacturing, it, it's it takes years. It's kind of like the chip issue where we wanted to just start making computer chips again. It, it's not as right. easy as just turn, you know, changing a factory to turning on a switch. It, it takes a long time. So, so in the meantime, you got to look out for yourself. Tell us a little bit about if somebody wants they're they're listening to this and they're like, "Holy cow! I didn't know that there was this many shortages and and that I had an option to do anything about this." What does somebody do? With JasonMedical.com is your website, right? What they go to that website? What should they expect and what will they need to do? So on the website, you know, if you still have questions, if you still have doubts, uh, we've got a lot of uh, resources there. You can read through the articles. You can go through the patient education. Uh, as far as the actual process, we, we divide it into, into two main categories. One is the emergency medication type. These are things you don't normally need, you don't normally take, but when you need them, you need them in a hurry. Uh, antibiotics being probably the biggest category there, but uh, could be steroid creams, could be eye drops, ear drops, could be um, uh, albuterol, epinephrine, that kind of stuff. We've got um, ivermectin, things like that. So that's going to be on that kind of emergency side. We we call it the Jace case. The Jace case is is our initial base product. It's five antibiotics. We consider these kind of the the, the five most critical. Uh, that any anyone and everyone should have on supply and at hand uh, for whether it's a grid down scenario or whether it's just a, hey it's a there I'm having a storm in or some some disruption in my area that I can't get to my my doctor uh, or a pharmacy um, and so that's the that's the Jace case on the other side of things you have our our Jace daily and those are the people who need a, a medication for chronic condition. And we've, we're adding medications to that list every day. It's hundreds long currently. And so you go on the site, if you're interested in the Jace Daily, for example, you go on the site, you start that daily path. You'll fill out a, a little bit of information to find out who you are and, and what medications you're taking. And, and you can also look to make sure that we carry the medication that you are currently taking. At the end of that process, it takes a few minutes. It's really not that, it's really not that involved. Uh, that information is reviewed uh, by a physician uh, assuming they they approve everything, they then send a prescription to one of our uh, our contracted pharmacies, and they will package and deliver uh, a year supply of your chronic medication. For example, um, on the other side of things, you know, back to the emergency medication, you can start with that Jace case. If you've got medications you want to add, maybe you want to add ivermectin, maybe you want to add 
um, uh, medication for yeast infections, uh, whatever our available add-ons are. We have about 30. Uh, you add those to your to to the Jay's case, and same process. That information goes to the physician. They review it, goes to the pharmacy, and the pharmacy delivers it to your door. Uh, the whole process, whether you're doing one or the other, uh, shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. And, and that's purposeful. We've tried to get just the information that we need to do this safely, legally. Um, and we've tried to make it as, as accessible and cost effective as we can. Okay. And so <clears throat> these pharmacies, uh, is it like a uh, Walgreens or, or is it like, what, what's the deal with the contracted pharmacies and that kind of thing? So, yeah, the that's reason I, I say that is, um, now you, you absolutely, and, and we, I, I will say in the three plus years we've been doing this, uh, it's happened maybe two or three times at most. You can come and and do this process and then ask for the for the prescription from the from the doctor and take it to a pharmacy. Uh, the reason we don't encourage that is because we are dealing with pharmacies that we've already come to and said, here's what we're doing, here's the medications we're after, here's the bulk volume we're doing, and we pass those savings on to the patient because at the end of the day, you're paying out of pocket for this. This is not something that's covered by insurance. You can use an HS, HSA or an FSA card or account uh, to pay, but as far as traditional insurance, um, that this is not something that's covered um, by your traditional health insurance. So you're going to be paying out of pocket. So anything we can do to to help with with those expenses from the the, the physician encounter to the medications themselves. So we've got we've got uh, a number of pharmacies that we've prearranged this pricing uh, with. If you were to go retail and pay retail at a pharmacy for a Jace case plus some add-ons and uh, you're, you're going to pay quite a bit more. Um, and gotcha. so that's, that's, that's where we, when I say contracted pharmacies and these pharmacies are, they're licensed, they're licensed to dispense medications in whatever state you're coming from. They're getting their medications from the exact same place that CVS and Walgreens and Walmart. Uh, we all, it turns out we all go to the same wholesalers. Um, right. and so your medications are coming from, from the same place. Uh, and so there's really no reason to, to go anywhere else uh, unless unless for some reason you just wanted to pay more. Very cool. So I, I, if I wanted to get some Oxycontin, you know, cause I, <laughs> right. Is that, uh, is that an option on the list? I'm, I'm just teasing, of course, option. but yeah, no, no, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, but, uh, the controlled substances are something that for now, um, there's just not a safe, there's not a safe way. Probably I would say as a physician, I would be very, if not, I, I just wouldn't do it. Um, understanding i mean i do understand the 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 need i understand all, all of that from the patient's perspective um but there's just too much risk and and the safety is just gotcha. not there so from a physician's perspective highly unlikely that any of our physicians would even do that but um just as importantly the dea has very stringent regulations and, and people who take these kind of medications understand them because they fight with it every month having to refill their medication and you can't get most cases, you can't get a, even a 90 day refill or even a 60 day. You're, you're, you're doing this every yeah, 30 yeah. days. Um, and that's a DEA thing. So we're not looking to, uh, to find any loopholes there or do it. Sure. So for now, um, controlled substances such as narcotics, such as um, your ADHD kinds of medications, um, those, are, those are just off the list. Um, everything else, though, is, is fair game. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me put a little, not everything else. The other ones would be medications that require a lot of monitoring. So there are certain medications, old medications like warfarin or Coumadin, and if anyone's ever heard of that, it's a blood thinning medication. Mm -hmm. um, it requires routine monitoring, sometimes uh, twice a week, sometimes weekly. Um, and so any any medication like that requires monitoring of levels um, is something that's just not not appropriate for this for this service, and something you need yeah. to just work closely with your own uh, primary docs with. So maybe talk a little bit about the general category. So you're probably talking about like blood pressure meds and, and maybe I mean, some really diabetic. Everything else. Yeah. You've got um, seizure, yeah, yeah. seizure medications, um, depression, anxiety, blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid. Um, really, it, it's, it really is everything else. And if okay. there's something where you go on our site, you type in your medication and it, and it, it doesn't come up as an available option, then we encourage you to please write in, send us an email, say, Hey, this is the medication. This is the formulation. This is how much I take. And we have a whole, a whole process in place to, to review those and get them in into our system. Uh, once they meet the approval from the physicians, you know, starting from scratch, we weren't able to just throw out there, you know, 3000 medications and start offering them. Everything has to go through a, a process 
that's vetted um, through the physicians, through the pharmacies uh, to make sure that it's going to be appropriate before we put it in the system. So uh, you can help us go to the site, let us know what medications you're taking. And if it's not on the list, then, then we'll review it. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about like the Jace case, kind of the original, the original thing. Why did you pick the five meds that you came up with? Like what, what's the thought process on that one? Yeah. So first, why did we start with antibiotics to begin with and and versus going like to the Jace daily or, or, or doing some other. And the reason is, again, we're talking medical preparedness and antibiotics are something that everyone should, should have appropriate access to. Um, you maybe had never, have never taken an antibiotic in your life, but in, in a true emergency situation, the likelihood of needing an antibiotic, whether it's to treat, uh, an animal bite, a human bite, um, a scrape that got infected, um, a UTI. If you look at the top causes of death, um, a hundred years ago, pre antibiotics, uh, they were all results of not having access to antibiotics. It was pneumonia. It was kidney failure, um, things that we now are able to treat easily with antibiotics. So, so that's why that's at the top of the list. I think with medical preparedness, um, you know, it's not something that we have to, you know, it depends on if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, everyone's got a unique history. Well, di- uh, antibiotics are, are, are more globally, I guess, necessary. So starting there and then saying, okay, well, w- there's a lot of antibiotics out there. So we need to consider what does the antibiotic cover and how much does the antibiotic cost? You know, it would be nice that everyone, if everyone could just have a, a mini pharmacy um, and have access to, so they can cover every eventuality, but that's, it's not cost effective and it, nor is it safe. So the, the ones that we chose were specifically kind of seen through that lens of, okay, I want to cover the most common things I might encounter um, if I was cut off from, from regular access to healthcare. So what are those most common things? And they're the ones I just mentioned, the, the scrapes, the UTIs. And then, and then we also want to cover what are the most deadly things? Uh, what are things that I, that I would probably die without access to, to an antibiotic? And that is specifically, we're talking about bioterror. Um, and in the bioterror realm, there's, there's three main agents that the government's identified as the most likely. We're talking about plague, tularemia, and uh, anthrax being the, the, the most likely agents. Those happen to be um, uh, effectively treated with one of two antibiotics, either uh, doxycycline or ciprofloxacin. And uh, so coming at, the, at, at, okay, we want to be able to treat for those things, those most deadly, because they're virtually 100% fatal if, it, if you're exposed and get sick. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we came with the five in our kit. And, and you get uh, amoxicillin, clavulanate, you get um, azithromycin, which is the Z-pack everyone's heard of. Uh, you get ciprofloxacin, you get doxycycline, and you get a medication called metronidazole. Now, the other important aspect here is what's the amount of medication you're getting? Are you getting enough to treat more than just one or two infections? Uh, again, if you're cut off from a, in a true grid down scenario, it might be some time before you actually get access to to whether to refill your medications or, or just to, to the health system in general. Um, and in those that bioterror um, incidents I talked about, you're talking about if there is an aerosolized anthrax attack, uh, the recommendation is that you, the entire population prophylactically take uh, two months worth of doxycycline, for example. So oh, wow. you're taking two pills a day every day for two months. And so if you look at, at, at what you're getting in the kit, you need to make sure that, that the amount is also uh, proper, not just that it's got a particular medication that you're looking for. Um, we do get that every once in a while where people, well, I'm used to this medication, or I took this when I had a UTI. Could I get that instead? Um, and we don't, we don't typically do that again, because we're looking at those criteria I mentioned before. Now, if you're allergic to a medication, many people are allergic to penicillin. So that amoxicillin, you would not be uh, safe for you to take. So we'll substitute that with something else. You're allergic to Cipro, for example, we'll substitute that for something else. Um, but those are, those are the five medications we include and why we include them. Gotcha. So if I remember correctly, the DOD did a big study on like storage of medicines and how long they last and all that. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So you're, you're talking about the shelf life extension program and and that was uh, the DOD commissioned the FDA to, 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 and it's ongoing. It's, it's an ongoing study. Like 28 Uh, years or something now. Yeah. You know, they, they maintain their own stockpiles of medications. They're having to 
to completely turn this stock over every year or two. And it was costing a lot of money and they wanted to know, are, do we really need to be getting rid of these medications? Are they really expired? So they went to the FDA, commissioned this study. As you said, it's ongoing. And uh, that also plays into, I should mention that that also plays into the medications that are in our kit. Because what you want at the end of the day is medications that are going to last as long as, 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 as you can. And that if, if or when they do start getting beyond their use-by date, they're not going to degrade into any kind of a toxic, unsafe substance, which does happen with some medications, mm -hmm. certainly some of the older antibiotics, um, tetracycline being one of them. That's that like any, usually anything liquid or like nitrate-based. Is that two of the main categories? For, for degradation? Yeah. 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 Um, in, in, the, in the tetracycline case, it actually uh, became more of a, a kidney killer. If you were to take right. tetracycline that was very old. Uh, it would it would significantly harm your kidneys to the point that you, you you could potentially end up dying from it. So, so the medications we've got, um, and 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 speaking in that shelf life extension program, it seems the key here is that you you store your medications properly. And the two greatest killers to to a medication are uh, heat and humidity. So sure. you need to keep them cool and dry. Uh, keeping them cool and dry, and assuming they've been kept cool and dry. Um, and we're talking in this case, uh, we're not talking about the liquids, as you mentioned, we're talking about pills and capsules. Right, yeah. um, the, the vast majority of these medications retain greater than 90% of their efficacy beyond five years. Mm -hmm. And with, with many of them actually showing um, that 90% or near 90% efficacy after 10, 15 years. Okay. Um, now, the FDA is very careful that they do this per lot. They can only say this particular lot of medications we tested sure, and sure. it's okay beyond this date. But I think it's safe to, to, to generalize uh, some of those results. And so there's nothing wrong with, cause if, if I remember correctly, you can get a new Jace case and, or a new allotment of yearly daily use prescriptions every year. There's nothing wrong with keeping that Jace case and getting another one and then getting another one and then getting another one. Is that okay? Right. Or what's the, what's the rule on that? Well, so let's see. The, I know that there might be a kind of a funny gray line you have to walk here on how to answer yeah. that. The, the pharmacist, I'm not a pharmacist, but if I were a pharmacist and when I create that label, I'm required by law to say that it expires one year from the date I dispense it. That's the okay. official expiration date of your medication. Gotcha. It also has a manufacturer's expiration date, but you're not getting that manufacturer's bottle in, in most cases. And so you can't see the date that's printed on there, but it is typically one to three years from the date it's manufactured. Okay. Um, and then you have this shelf life extension program. So I would say, you know, yes, as long as, as long as you've, you can be confident in the, in how it's been stored and that it hasn't been exposed to the, to, to the elements, as we mentioned, um, then, then yeah, you could keep stuff on hand. Certainly. And if you understood that in, in a horrible scenario where, where again, we're talking that kind of grid down issue and it's been a long time, it's better to try something than nothing. Sure, um, sure. And so, yeah, um, it's just one of those things that, yeah, I, I, I do have to be a little careful in encouraging yeah. people to just keep a lot of old medications on hand. Well, I think it, it, it probably goes to speak to a little bit about the climate that you're in, too, because if you're in like Florida or Mississippi or Alabama where there's a lot of humidity and all that kind of thing, you might want to pay a little bit more attention to it if you're kind of in that southern humid belt, make, you know, and or make plans in how you in how you do store them, you know, putting them in airtight containers, right, using oxygen absorbers. Uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, no. Okay. That, that makes, that makes perfect sense. So uh, you said that ivermectin is included in there. Ivermectin, there's a lot of controversy about ivermectin and whether it's good to treat COVID and all that kind of stuff. What is your general thoughts about that? I assume since you guys offer it, you think it's effective for something at least. Right. Well, so in, in, in our case and recall kind of that uh, uh, when I explained the process, when you come to the site, you're dealing with, uh, to, in order for this to be elite, to be legal, to be safe and appropriate, uh, the checks and balances that are in place are important to consider. The the physician needs to to be able to practice uh, with autonomy. It needs to be independent of of the business side of things. And so our physicians make their decisions. Um, and so and, and think about the the through the lens of, of ivermectin here. So you've got a, a physician who needs to be able to think independently and, and act independently. Then you have a pharmacist who has to dispense this medication who also is under their own uh, uh, board and license guidelines uh, that yeah, they yeah. that they are not dispensing any medication that they think is going to be harmful. 
Um, and so those are the prob probably the two biggest players. And you've got all the optics that you mentioned. And thankfully, there's been a lot of, uh, I'd say, a, a lot of progress made in the last few months. Uh, the FDA was involved in a lawsuit by a few doctors who ha um, were saying, hey, FDA, you're not in the practice. You are not supposed to be practicing medicine. You're not supposed to be putting out the kind of information they put out about ivermectin. And, and, they, and they won. Uh, the FDA had to remove all of that stuff from all those recommendations and posts that they had. Um, and at the end of the day, it's between you and your doctor. If your doctor feels that this is a safe, appropriate use, then that's okay. Um, to answer your question, I guess, so at Jace, uh, our ivermectin, it, it, so ivermectin has been around for a long time and yeah. it's, it's, it treats mainly parasitic type illnesses. Uh, gotcha. River blindness being one of the biggest ones in places like Africa, where it's it's been proven safe and effective for decades. It's been given billions of times in, as far as doses. Uh, Is that like something you take pro prophylactically, like if you travel to Africa and that kind of thing? Or Yeah, yeah. So like if you're talking about the, those other parasitic type uses for it, whether it's um, like scabies, lice, uh, yeah, like the river blindness, um, there, yes. Mm -hmm. uh there are uses, appropriate uses for ivermectin to, to treat all those things. Okay. Uh, and that's at the end of the day, when we prescribe it, uh, it's given for that indication. Now we have now, it's been well-documented, numerous studies. I think of all this, if you look at all the studies and it can get really confusing, I myself walk away a lot of times shaking my head and just what's going on here as a physician, reading a, a paper that's very well written and shows that there was there was no benefit to giving this, this COVID patient ivermectin. And then you turn around and read this paper. It's a meta study. They looked at all these studies and they showed, Hey, this is, there was real uh, demonstrable uh, benefit here. Mm -hmm. So I fall in, in kind of the middle of saying, I know at, at worst, it's not hurting. Mm -hmm. uh, despite a lot of the claims out there that, that it can be, it's, it is one of the, the more safe medications that we've had for some time. Yes, you do have to give it in in a, in a slightly higher dose than you would normally, but it's been proven to be for the vast majority of patients, it's a safe medication. So it's not hurting anyone. And now whether it's it's helping as much as people feel like it is or or less, um, I think it's at that point maybe it's just your own personal experience. I have I have a lot of patients that I've had personal interactions with who have had had great results with it. Others who weren't sure it helped a whole lot. So, so I am of the opinion that, Hey, it's not a bad idea to have. And if I were, if I were if personally, me speaking personally, if I were to get, uh, COVID and when I did have COVID, uh, uh, two years ago, did I take ivermectin? I did. Um, and so, so that's where I fall on it. Um, there is a, there's unfortunately, I, I, I hope we can get to the point back again where doctors can, can do what they feel is best for their patients without having to worry about repercussions. Sure. So a lot of preppers and, you know, people in the prepper community, they, they like to think of themselves as people who would be helpful in an accident and first responder kind of situations and stuff like that. Um, do you guys offer, and I, and I don't remember from your website, but do you guys offer like EpiPens and things, you know, like those kinds of emergency sort of things? Okay. So you're thinking, okay, so this is interesting. And the, 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 you're what you're if I'm understanding right, you're thinking this is not necessarily for you. You want to have yeah. this stuff kit so that you can have and that would be difficult for you guys to prescribe that way then unless you had somebody yeah. in your family or yourself. Yeah, or but but it's something that we are actively talking about. And I think we've we we have a solution for um in order to do that because you're right. At the end of the day, um someone who's having uh an anaphylactic reaction is unable to give themselves their own epinephrine. Yeah. And so right. Uh, you know, and, and, and for this particular medication to be used inappropriately and unsafely, it's, it's more likely than not that it would be needed appropriately. So, uh, yeah. yes, that's something that, that we have uh, are actively discussing and I, and I believe will be forthcoming here shortly. Uh, but again, it's getting those people on board. It's getting the doctors on board, the pharmacists on board, um, and sure. showing them here's how we've gone through the proper checks and balances. Here's why this is going to be safe to do in a way that hasn't always been traditionally done this way. So that could be something coming down the road, but you're still still working on that one. Albuterol would be another one. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the biggest would be albuterol and, and the EpiPens. Mess, albuterol is like a inhaler yeah, for having yeah. an exacerbation, or yeah. uh, or for the EpiPen, someone who's having an anaphylactic allergic reaction. I think those would be the two most common reasons why you might have a medication in your kit that you don't need, 
um, you're, but someone else might. Uh, Narcan would be the other one. Um, Narcan. I was going to ask about Narcan too. Narcan. Is that, yeah. You are. You do have it now, or you're yes, going. Do. You do. Okay. Because yeah, that and you talk a little bit about Narcan and how that how that. Yeah. Works so works. Narcan is is uh, given for and here's here's I think the important thing to know about Narcan because I think people may have heard about it. They know, you know this is for people who overdose on on whether on some kind of opiate whether that's uh, an illicit uh, drug off the street or whether they're taking painkillers and accidentally took too many, uh, but they're, they basically had an overdose of an opiate. Um, mm -hmm. And so Narcan is the reversal agent that we give to these people. So I think a lot of people will think, well, I'm not around drug addicts. Uh, yeah. There's no painkillers in my house. I don't need Narcan. Unfortunately, uh, we live in a day and age now where we've got these medications like this super potent fentanyl where mm -hmm. just being just breathing a whiff of it or being exposed just tangentially to it, uh, you can end up on the ground in respiratory distress. Talk to any of the of the policemen out there um, who, you know, in, in confront this every day um, yeah. as a real danger where you might not even just, just touching this person. Um, you can absorb it in your skin and, and, uh, and end up in, in basically what it does is it stops your, your, your ability to breathe. Um, and so having access to Narcan, it's just a prudent thing that uh, that everyone should have because uh, you never know um, with these powerful um, drugs that are out there and floating around, even though you might not think you're directly um, interacting with them. Uh, they're so powerful that it just doesn't take much. Very good. So um, what is, if you could talk maybe a little bit about cost on this, what, what is it generally? I know it's probably going to vary depending on if you get the case or if you get your daily meds and stuff, but yeah. what, what's some averages that people might expect to, you know, see when they check out? So in the, it's really, it's almost impossible to say for the daily side of things, because it is so particular to your kind of medication. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And, and so those costs, they're, they're all over the board. The other one that maybe is a little easier to pin down would be RJ's case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's $260 to access those five medications. You're getting five medications in the amounts I described. So enough to treat uh, for a bioterror uh, event for two months for, for yourself. Um, then you're getting the, obviously the physician encounter um, to get the prescription. And then you're getting additional guidance in the form of, uh, you know, it comes with a guidebook so that if you don't have access to your doctor to a, a healthcare professional, you don't have access to the internet. You've got this book that's written in a way to tell you, here's your symptoms, here's the med in your kit, here's how often and how much you should take. Um, and then you're getting ongoing support to answer questions you might have um, anytime you need. And, and so that's that $260. From there, you can add on whether it's uh, things like ivermectin, whether maybe you want to add on Zofran. Zofran's a medication, it's also called Ondansetron. It's a medication you take as a to, for nausea and vomiting. Um, okay. so any kind of, you can add those th things as well and, and, and get, but that starts at $260 and it just goes up depending on what you want to add. And then, so if I understand it right, if I've got four people in my family, can I just do two for the adults or is there a section for kids too? Good. Great question. We do have, you know, we started that mission with, with, for adults. We, uh, then were able to offer it for kind of the teenagers and 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 we're now uh, able to include children as well. Um, the there is a there is a cutoff there because it, you know the really small kids, the six month old, the one year old kids, um, they're so dependent on number one what their weight is, and it changes so much from week to week, and that changes yeah. the dosing. Um, and then number two, the that it's uh, the 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 safety difference is harder for the physicians to justify because you know a, a sick kiddo. Um, there's a lot of different things it could be and getting them appropriately evaluated and treated. Um, you can get yourself into hot water by assuming you know what it is and treating it inappropriately more so with kids than, than, than with an adult. So that's where that cutoff comes in. But, but yeah, so we can now offer for the children, for teens and for adults, for the teens, it's, it's the same kit. Um, it's, it just goes through a different process because they are not the, they need to be, uh, you have to go through the process as a guardian or as a parent, gotcha. uh, but you're basically getting the, the exact same kit as the adults get for the children. It is a different kit. Um, it's a little cheaper uh, because it doesn't include uh, as many antibiotics. Um, the, the, the thing here is your, your child needs to be able to, not very many antibiotics come in a dissolvable or chewable form. Um, and so that limits us there. 
Gotcha, um, gotcha. But that's, so it is a little bit cheaper for the kids, um, but you're still getting uh, things like the, the amoxicillin, which is really a go-to and important medication to have on hand. Yeah, I think I, I can't even count the number of times that I've had to use amoxicillin with my kids when we were growing up. I mean, I, a, a lot. Dofran, which is that nausea and vomiting. So, you know, commonly with kids, you're, they're going to have some kind of a, um, a gastrointestinal um, problem where they're, they're either have too much vomiting and diarrhea. And it's not so much the vomiting and diarrhea because that's not most of the time. It's not a bacterial illness. It's not treated with amoxicillin or other antibiotics. It's a viral illness. But they're, they don't have the same reserves and, and, and ability to withstand this stuff as we do. And so they get dehydrated really quick. And that dehydration is what puts them in the hospital, what's puts, it was what puts them into kidney failure and other organ issues. So keeping your child hydrated um, is, is, is kind of the number one goal with those kinds of illnesses. And having some Zofran on hand is, can, can go a long ways there. What do you recommend for like hydration salts, like, like element or Pedialyte or what was your Pedialyte? And I tell my, I tell my parents with kids because Pedialyte, if anyone's tasted it, it's horrible. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's, it's, you would just need your kid to be hydrated. And if they are refusing to drink Pedialyte, put a little Sprite in there, put a little Gatorade, put, put a little sugar with it. Um, it's, it's, it would be better without, um, mm -hmm. but it's certainly better than, than nothing. Um, and so I'm okay with that, even with my own kids, um, yeah. as long as they're getting hydrated and because this is a short period of time as they're not going to live off Gatorade. They're not going to live on soda. Sure. If, I, sure. if I'm going to put a little something in that Pedialyte to make them happy and drink, that's what I do. Is what about, what are your thoughts on element? Have you heard of that? Uh, um, I'm LMNT. not particularly familiar with, with what's in element. I've okay. heard of it. It's, it's essentially just, I think it's uh, like potassium and like, magnesium yeah. and sodium. Yeah. That's about I it. mean, it, so that's the other thing is just giving them water. Uh, a, a lot of ways is, is, is most of the time that's not going to cut it They're When right. they're throwing up and when they're having diarrhea, they're losing a lot of those electrolytes. They're losing that potassium uh, particularly. And, and that, that has, you know, low potassium can have devastating effects. Um, and then you need some of those other minerals to absorb everything else, the magnesium and everything else. So, and the sodium. So the, yes, it's important to have something that's not just water and water has some minerals in it, depending on where your water comes from. Yeah. Um, so that's why we supercharge it with, with things like, like your element or, or Pedialyte or yeah. even Gatorade. Sure. Okay. Excellent. Well, what, what should I have asked you that I didn't ask so far? Is there, yeah. is there anything? Yeah, we, um, I can't particularly think of anything other than just as we're talking about all these medications, we're talking about emergency preparedness. Um, something that I've experienced firsthand in different, different, uh, uh, disaster areas, um, is having a, a record. It needs to, you can have it on your phone. You can have a digital, that's fine, but it needs to be written down somewhere as well of, of who's taking what, why they're taking it, what allergies they have, having that information uh, becomes really important. And don't just assume that uh, you've got to have it for anyone that's in your circle uh, that could potentially be incapacitated, unable to communicate. Mm. Uh, you know, you might, maybe it's grandpa or grandma. And if you don't know what they're taking and why, um, and they're not able to communicate themselves, you're of no help to them. So and that's, gonna... that's interesting. So basically if I understand what you're saying is, is you kind of want to have like a, like a medical card or a, a contact card or something so that if they have to go get treatment somewhere, you can say, Hey, this person is on these meds. They take, this is what they take. This is their known allergies. This is sort of their history, so to speak. Yep. Yep. And I that way if they're the... incapacitated, you can, you can kind of be able to yeah, you don't want to yes don't assume that they'll be able to do it for themselves and and uh, you know being uh i was i was on the ground just after the the fires in in maui um mm -hmm. and one of the most pressing needs after people had been evacuated the sickest quickly got out to the hospitals then you had everyone else and the most pressing need uh, because food and water i mean it came flooding in and i'm not saying this is how it'd be all the time but but those those needs were met really quickly. What mm -hmm. people couldn't just flood in were medications that you, you yeah. know, you, someone's blood pressure medication, someone's seizure medication, someone's insulin. And, and so, uh, having number one, having access to your own supply, but then, and, and a lot of times we were, and we didn't have access there. The communications were down. There was no way to access the internet. Um, there was no way to, to, to pull up anyone's records and and you've got an elderly person maybe they don't re recall exactly what they're taking um so having that in a written format is is huge 
do you guys have a like a form or a template on your website for that or um, no we don't but well, i think you just gave us a, a great idea yeah for i was gonna say if you if you guys come up with something or help me come up with one i'd definitely distribute uh, that out and oh, yeah, make it I'll available for download on our site yeah yeah it's a great idea we'll do it very cool so jacemedical.com that's the place to go uh sean thank you for J -A -S -E, jace medical you can even go to jace jase.com and it'll it'll take you there it'll get you there well you yep. can use the discount code reality 10 and that'll save you 10 bucks off of your order um so guys head on over there and check it out i think it's a great resource and it's definitely something that is you know underutilized and um just people don't really think about it all that much you know and it's it's definitely something that's important for being prepared especially in the, the day and age that we live in so thanks again doc for coming on i appreciate having you here that was great. Thanks so much. All right.